we should get started. So thanks everybody um, for staying for the uh, final, and I'm gonna go on on a limb and say most important since I do ethics, <laughs> uh, most important session of the day. Um, and also thanks to our earlier speakers and um, everybody for the really stimulating, I thought, discussion um, in, in, in the first few sessions. So my name is Spencer Hay. I teach uh, research ethics in the Masters of Bioethics program at uh, the Harvard Medical School. Um, I'm going to be moderating this last uh, panel for the day on um, ethics in ordeals research. Um, we're going to hear, we're going to start um, this final panel. We're going to hear again from um, Jessica Cohen. Um, and her remarks will then be followed by Charles Freed and then Dan Wickler. Um, so before I hand it over to Jessica, just want to say for all the speakers and everyone on our panel and discussants, I have heard that um, we're having a hard time hearing in the back. And so if everybody could just be sure to speak into the microphone, um, make, sure that, make sure that your comments are heard. That would be much appreciated. OK, without further ado. That's good. <laughs> OK, hi. Uh, so this is, um, I was asked to present an example of a, um, a study that um, evaluated um, an ordeal. Uh, it's not a study that I designed, and um, you shouldn't take my presentation of it as the uh, indication that I endorse it or don't endorse it. Um, but I think it's just, I guess, to get us started with a concrete example. Um, so um, people have already mentioned um, this example of micro ordeals in uh, water purification. So this is based on a paper that um, Pascaline Dupas, who's an economist at Stanford, and some other economists did in, um, in Kenya. And so the background here is that, as I mentioned, diarrheal disease is a leading cause of child mortality globally, and in Kenya in particular, and water is a um, major channel for transmission of these diseases. And there are a lot of different ways that you can reduce diarrheal disease. You can um, encourage hand washing. Um, you can improve um, uh, sanitation, and toilet facilities, um, and many other things. Uh, but one way is to provide households with what's called point of use water purification, which means that you can purify your water at the, at the point of use, as opposed to, for example, at the source where you collect it or um, something like that. And so at the time of the study, a version of this product, which was called WaterGuard, uh, was being sold to households um, at a subsidized price through what's called a social marketing NGO, which is basically a nonprofit that also uses sort of commercial approaches to try to increase uh, distribution of products like branding, uh, things like that. Um, and so... Um, it was known that for the sort of poorest households, the ones that were most vulnerable to diarrheal disease, this product needed to be subsidized in order to reach them, uh, to reach meaningful levels of coverage with this product, but how much to subsidize it and what the trade-offs were, uh, were of interest to them. So um, the issues here are actually similar to the bed net example. So if chlorine is given for free, you will definitely achieve high access, right? But um, a lot of people might take it um, who wouldn't end up using it. And so why might people who have chlorine not use it? Well, it doesn't, you know, it makes your water taste like a pool. I can attest to that. Um, uh, there's an inconvenience. So every time that you um, want to drink some water, you have to um, add this and you have to wait. Uh, you have to remember to do it every time that you um, purify the water. You could want to use the chlorine for other things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a lot of reasons why people who own the thing might not be using it. And the idea here is that if you increase the price, maybe you screen out people who, um, would, who value the product less and wouldn't have used it. Um, and as we mentioned in the bed net example, on the other hand, as you increase the price or reduce the subsidy, you might actually just screen out the poorest people who really need it the most and would have used it. Um, and so the authors wanted to first explore that trade-off. So the trade-offs that arise from different levels of subsidy. So they compare in this study, one of the fundamental comparisons is distributing the chlorine product for free versus distributing it for a 50% subsidy. But they also introduced a third option, which was what they called a micro ordeal, um, in which chlorine was given for free, but participants had to redeem um, vouchers in order to get it. So here's the setup. Um, they recruited patients that were waiting um, for a, an outpatient um, uh, uh, visit uh, for, um, for children. So they enrolled people that had uh, children aged 6 to 12 months. 
and they randomize them into one of three arms. So either what they called a cost-sharing arm, which meant that they offered water treatment um, for a 50% subsidy right at that moment, um, a voucher's arm, which meant that they gave people um, a booklet of 12 vouchers, which they could go to a local clinic or shop um, to redeem uh, and to get a bottle of uh, water purification. So they had 12 of those, which had to be redeemed sort of sequentially. So they had one for January, one for February, one for March, et cetera. And then they had the free delivery arm in which they gave people right there a bottle of free chlorine, and then they gave them another one, I think, four or five months later. Um, and so there was three types of data that they looked at. There was a baseline survey that they did while the people were at the clinic waiting for the, the child to be um, seen. This, some of these visits were just uh, well baby visits and some of them were sick child visits, I think. Um, they had a follow-up survey at people's households three to five months after enrollment. And then they had administrative data on purchases and voucher redemptions. And there, there are two main outcomes of interest. So one was take up, right? So how many people take it when you offer it at different prices? So like I mentioned in the bed net example, when we increase the price from zero to 50 cents, we, we got a 60 percentage point drop in coverage. So extremely price sensitive to this important preventive health product. So it's important for us to, to see that. Um, and then also, and so they wanted to see take up when you give people a voucher. So how much are people willing to go get it? And then they also wanted to look at usage. So the way they measured that was by um, a test that detected chlorine in people's stored water at their home um, three to five months after enrollment. So they wanted to compare these three different approaches, free distribution, cost sharing, and the micro ordeal in terms of take up and usage. And so the results, okay, so um, like we found in the bed net example, take up under even small amounts of cost sharing is very uh, poor in this context. Part of it is that it's a developing country, part of it is that it's a preventive health product, and that's a whole other discussion. But basically, you know, if you give people a free bottle of chlorine, basically 100% of people will take it. But when they charged a 50%, uh, 50% when they introduced an in a 50% subsidy instead of 100%, only 12% of people purchased. Um, at least two bottles, let alone. Um, so half the people purchased one bottle, and only 12% of people purchased enough for more than like one month. So extremely price sensitive. And then in the vouchers arm, with the micro ordeal, 85% of people went to redeem at least one voucher, so one bottle, and 40% of the peop of the 12 bottles overall were redeemed. Um, and so. Um, then they look at usage. And so here's what's really interesting, right? So even though a lot more people got a free bottle of chlorine and took it when it was free, then went to get it with the voucher, basically the same, almost exactly the same fraction of people had chlorine in their water at the time of follow-up, right? So that's what this is saying. So basically <laughs> when, um, does this have a laser? <coughs> so when, um, when the bottle is free, 34% of people have chlorine in their water, right? So let's pause there for actually for just a second and note that 66% of people who took a free bottle did not have chlorine in their water at the time of follow-up. So this gets back to some of the points that Till raised, which is why are usage rates so low and what are some other things we could do to improve usage rates beyond sort of rationing approaches? But if you compare the vouchers arm and the free arm, 33% of people in the vouchers arm had stored chlorine in their water at home also, despite the fact that so many fewer people uh, were getting the chlorine um, in the micro ordeal setup. So here's the interpretation. So basically, take up is universal under free when you just give the thing out for free with usage rates around 34%. And while take up with vouchers or the ordeals is lower than free distribution, overall usage rates are basically the same, suggesting that nearly everyone who redeemed their voucher was using it, right? And so the targeting worked really well without a big drop in access or take up. Um, and so in this particular example, ordeals are the most cost effective method of distribution with almost no loss in coverage relative to free distribution. 
Um, and another important point to make here is that distribution through these existing supply chains like shops and clinics, yes, it's somewhat of an ordeal for people to go and get it, but it's actually a much more efficient, um, cheaper way of distributing this product than going to people's homes all the time and giving them water solution. Like, so being able to distribute them through a shop or a clinic is theoretically much more cost effective. So there's lots of reasons why people um, don't use this product. So targeting it in some way or increasing use seems key. I think an important question to consider is whether a micro ordeal is the best way to increase coverage of this life-saving product. Um, and as Till had mentioned before, what about focusing on increasing usage rates among people who have it? Another thing to think about is what the people who went to redeem the vouchers sort of otherwise would have been doing with their time. And are, is that an okay thing that they traded off? And sort of what the basis for the decision to redeem the voucher was. Um, was it sort of willy-nilly or were people really thinking through, am I going to use this? Do I need it? Um, and um, like I have mentioned in my other talk, this ordeal really relies on people being sort of organized and remembering to do this, which I think is a, um, an interesting thing to, uh, for us to consider. Thanks. This session, I've been told, is on the subject of the ethics of ordeal research. So, it is a second order ethical inquiry. Uh, uh, in the first two sessions, we were concerned from time to time with uh, the ethics of the ordeal itself. Here, it's a question of the ethics of ordeal research. So this is uh, second degree ethics. Uh, and here, uh, the authors uh, of, uh, of the paper, which Jessica summarized for us, uh, who are here, I think, uh, some of them. What? Um, this, they were struck by the fact that this paper was accepted for publication by Science Magazine without an eyebrow being lifted on ethical grounds, the uh, premise, therefore, is that, the, it, that at the second degree, ordeals research, not ordeals, but ordeals research, raises no ethical questions. Well, uh, the uh, conveners of this uh, asked me to participate because a very long time ago, I was concerned about uh, the use of randomized trials, the ethics of randomized trials uh, at the first degree, uh, whether you uh, use medical or surgical uh, means for dealing with uh, uh, angina pectoris, or whether you use uh, chemotherapy and uh, radiology or radical mastectomy. And at the time, very controversial, and it was thought that the only way to uh, somehow resolve these questions is through a randomized clinical trial. And this raised, in fact, uh, important ethical questions. Uh, but I think only at the first degree, in the sense that the physician, because a person uh, with angina or a person with uh, with breast cancer is certainly going to have a physician. Uh, and that physician is certainly uh, obligated by lots of things, starting with the Hippocratic Oath, to use his or her best judgment in respect to the patient before the physician, what would be best for that patient. Uh, 
which involve some intuitions about how these things work, uh, but also uh, the lifestyle of the patient and how it would impinge on that, and so on. And uh, the only way I could think of resolving that issue for the physician was if the physician could honestly say that the choice between the two therapies was in equipoise. Truly, I don't know. Which would you do, doctor? I don't know. I think I'd flip a coin. And if you can honestly say that, then that physician is not <clears throat> in any way in conflict with his Hippocratic oath or whatever. The trouble is that this commits you to continuing ignorance, to continuing uh, uh, fealty to uh, therapies which are not the best therapies, which do not work, uh, but which doctors somehow intuitively like. So what to do? Well, there, what you want to do in Hegelian terms, aufgeheben, you want to go to the second level. And there, you go to the National Institute of Health. And the National Institute of Health says, we are doing this study, and you, the physicians, can only, uh, can only treat your patients within this study, which let's say will be free, uh, if you agree to randomization. In other words, uh, the physician may not choose to randomize, but the system for which the physician works insists on randomization, and for very good reason, because that system has as its patient as it were, uh, the patient population, not the individual before the physician. And that uh, population is ill-served if uh, therapeutic choices continue to be made on intuition, on instinct, uh, and not on the best scientific information. So, uh, the thing operates at two levels. Now, here in Ordeal's research, we've got a somewhat different and, may I say, ethically more benign uh, situation because there's no question of withholding a clearly advantageous uh, therapy from people who could take advantage for, of it. The only question is, how is it to be distributed? Now, th these distributional questions can come up in several ways. If, in fact, the good is not really scarce at all, uh, and the chlorine, I think, is hardly scarce, it is so cheap that charging for it is not uh, a relevant intervention in terms of somehow distributing it to people who really need it. Rather, the various distributional <coughs> modes, which Jessica talked to us about, uh, are intended to uh, do two things to elicit information, which it did, and also to, in the long run, determine not only what is the least wasteful way to distribute the chlorine, but also what is the way to distribute it which will incentivize the uh, recipients to actually use it. Uh, and that is a different sort of situation, 
and confronts a, the, uh, a, the distributor with a very different ethical problem. The distributor is trying to help these people, all of them, and all of them are going to get this, but under different protocols. Uh, a token price, and I think of my $1.50 uh, in voting, uh, the micro ordeal, or uh, simply for free. And the point was to find out how you can get the uh, uh, subjects to actually make use of this stuff and to benefit themselves. So I think this raises a rather different ethical question. Furthermore, if you introduce scarcity, and if Richard were here, he would tell us that there is always scarcity, uh, even with something as cheap as chlorine, if you introduce scarcity, then you have a situation where the good has to be distributed somehow, on some principle. And the desire is to distribute it where it will uh, be used most. And the research is simply to discern what uh, is necessary to get people to uh, use the stuff. Well, uh, the way this was done in this, uh, in this article in, in Science, which Jessica told us about, there was randomization. I believe it was between villages. Uh, well, uh, there is an ethical problem after all. And there is an ethical principle after all. Uh, the people from village A may know some of the people from village uh, A. And they will say, oh, you got it for free. I had to walk across town. How come? Uh, if the uh, distributor, the person in charge of the program, can answer that question honestly, then the ethical issue melts away. Transparency uh, substitutes, if you like, for equipoise. Uh, and if the uh, persons running the system uh, have to lie or have to come up with some obfuscation, then that is the ethical problem not the fact that some people are getting a different uh, benef a, a benefit uh, on a different distributional basis. So I think that uh, in these situations where what you're doing is you're trying to allocate a scarce resource or a resource at all, either where it will do the most good, or where it will incentivize people to use it rather than to discard it, then the uh, only ethical constraint is that you should be able to uh, simply state what you're doing and why you're doing it. Uh, now, in many randomized trials, uh, that principle of transparency, or can't referred to as, as publicity, uh, would ruin the trial. Uh, because if you tell people that's why we're doing it, some of them may choose not to participate in the trial. I'm thinking of the breast cancer or the angina pectoris. Uh, but in this situation, I don't believe it would, uh, it would destroy the, uh, the experiment and the ethical problems would be uh, such as the editors of science thought they were. That is to say, non-existent. Thank you. Uh, for my remarks, I'm going to rely on um, this uh, classic text that's called 
medical experimentation, personal integrity, and social policy, enormously influential in the field, written in the, uh, er, in the early 70s by Professor Charles Fried. Um, so I, I show that partly to honor uh, Charles Fried and to say what a privilege it is to be on the same panel as he is. Uh, but also because I think he contradicted what he said in the book. Uh, so <laughs> now um, I had my own remarks, but uh, you know when you lay out an argument like that, I, uh, the debater in me thinks, "Oh, the hell with those remarks! I'll, I'll <laughs> just attack him." And you know that might be more interesting too. But I think I can combine these two um, uh, goals. Let's see about it. So uh, I, I, I think Professor Freep was exactly right. What we're doing this panel is we're not talking about the ethics of ordeals. We're talking about the ethics of trials of ordeals. Okay, so that's a, you know, it's a different question. Uh, when someone does a trial, um, are they doing the right thing? Um, excuse me, got to get a piece of paper. Thank you. This always helps to have your notes. Um, now, uh, the, 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 what this is pointing us toward is the question, is there something in the nature of trials of ordeals that raises questions, um, ethical questions, um, that you know, are, are not the same kinds of questions you just run into in other kinds of trials? Um, my view is uh, basically no. Um, and I th trying to combine agendas here, I think Professor Freed actually says yes. And uh, I want to dispute what he said and also dis dispute the answer he gave. But let me run through my thing first. So uh, the two ways in which uh, trials of ordeals are, are different is, uh, first of all, they involve ordeals. Uh, trials that are not trials of or ordeals generally don't. Um, so is that a problem? Well, of course, or or ordeals can be annoying. They can be... Um, uh, 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 worse than that, uh, uh, we uh, near talked about the uh, idea that's attributed apparently wrongly to Bentham that um, if you're going to be eating at a soup kitchen, um, we have to make sure that uh, that uh, you actually uh, belong there. That this isn't just someone who could easily afford to feed themselves, but who decided to eat at the public expense. So you have to humiliate them and make it, make it a very unpleasant thing for that person to do that. Well, that's unpleasant. So to the extent that uh, the ordeal is unpleasant, then that raises an issue because you shouldn't, you shouldn't do things uh, that are unpleasant if you don't have to and that don't have a corresponding benefit. So that's pretty obvious. More important, I think, is that ordeals can uh, result in unmet needs. Now, if you look at the present case, the, the study that Jessica just ran us through, the amazing thing was that the ordeal arm and the free arm had virtually the same result. So it didn't deny uh, anybody anything. Well, that's pretty impressive. But Jessica earlier said that it's very hard to anticipate when, the or when an ordeal is going to have uh, a result like that, as opposed to uh, the result that a lot of people are deterred from getting care that they actually need. So at the time you're doing a trial, which is what counts, you know, hindsight isn't what's important here. The time you're doing a trial, you don't know. It could very well be that imposing this ordeal as a condition of getting the, what you need will result in, in people not getting what they need. And that's something that has, has to be um, um, uh, thought about. Now, um, in the case of, of uh, uh, chlorinated water, we're sort of downstream from the actual health event that would concern us. You know, you, you come to a household and you, you look at the water supply and you see, is this chlorinated or not? The reason you care about that, of course, is that if it's, if it's not chlorinated, the likelihood that a child will get diarrhea goes up. So it's a little bit hard to, to get the, uh, a vivid sense of why denial of care or people not getting what they need matters. It would help if we just did some multiplication here and focused in on the one or more children who are going to die of a diarrheal disease because uh, their parents didn't chlorinate the water. And the reason they didn't is because they were in the arm of the study that resulted in that. Now, in this case, as I said, the ordeal didn't have that result. That's great. But remember, there was a third arm of the study, and that was the one that imposed a price constraint. And it was known already, the, the trialists anticipated 
that if you charge some money, it wasn't a whole lot of money, but for these people it was, and whether there's a whole lot of money, it doesn't matter. We know that imposing a, a charge means that a lot of people just aren't going to buy. So that means that there was one arm of the study where um, the, the structure of the delivery system uh, that involved cost sharing meant that uh, in a way that the trialists could anticipate, so many homes were not going to have uh, water that was fit to drink. And uh, given what we know about the effects of that on health, which is, of course, the whole point of this, some kids are probably going to uh, die as a result. Now, that's, that's pretty, you know, now we have something we have to really be troubled about. Should they have had that arm in the study? Well, look, this is something that comes up a lot, and it's not unique to ordeals trials. Um, it's, it's a kind of standard feature of, uh, tragically, of uh, studies where um, you anticipate that if you, if you put a whole lot more money into it, um, people would live who are going to die given the way you're doing it. Why do you do it this way? It's not because there's not enough money to give everybody the product they need. Uh, presumably, if uh, the, 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 the big shortage here, uh, the big problem, the reason you're not giving people what they need is not that you don't have enough money to buy the supplies. It's because you want to see what happens if you do it the way you're doing it in the trial. And the reason you're doing that is that it can inform um, uh, the, uh, the way that donors attack a huge population-wide problem. And if you don't set it up exactly the way you're doing, you'll misguide them, and many, many more people will die. So there's an, you're creating an artificial shortage. Uh, that's, you know, when you, when you think vividly about the deaths that are going to result, because you set it up that way, it gives you pause, and it certainly should give you pause. But hey, there's no other way to do this. So that, that's true in, the, in this ordeal study, although it's not the ordeal arm that posed the question. It was the cost-sharing arm. But you know, that's not unique to these studies either. Um, now, I think what is sort of unique, but it's not, it's not unique is the wrong word, what's distinctive about these trials, the ordeals trials, uh, is distinctive also in a broader class of trials uh, as I think Dr. Fried uh, said with complete justification, this is not a clinical trial. We're not talking about a doctor who says to a patient, I'm going to give you this or that, and where we think that doctor has Hippocratic obligations that, that are binding on that doctor. This is about how to distribute uh, chlorine tablets. Um, no doctor really involved in this. So the Hippocratic part goes away. Okay, that's all true. Um, the thing is, we already know what the chlorine does. So in a clinical trial, you're, what you're often doing, the usual thing you're doing, is finding out whether a certain agent, certain product, certain technique or, or uh, device, whether it has a positive net impact on the health of the people who try it. That's what the whole purpose of the trial is. And the equipoise requirement that, that Dr. Fried, uh, Professor Fried talked about uh, is, uh, is, makes it OK for a doctor to participate in a trial like that. Um, uh, even though what the individual doctor may prefer to give to the patient is not what is going to be given to the patient. It's, it's really right, right on the knife edge. But that's not the case. We know that chlorine will have a positive effect on children's health. It'll reduce the risk of dying from diarrheal disease. So that research has already been done already. Now the question is, um, you know, how to distribute it. But the thing is, um, although we don't have equipoise, uh, for that reason, that just puts the shoe on the other foot, and it's the foot that hurts. That means that we do know that if you don't give that chlorine, if you do something that's going to result in people not getting that chlorine, deaths will happen. And you're creating that situation because you could give them that. You're just not doing it because otherwise, what's the point of your study? So the, the, the ethical gap here, so to speak, is between what you could easily, rather easily do. You know, chlorine is cheap. You could give to everybody in all these trials have no conditions. But of course, then you have no study. <coughs> so you don't do it, but you could do it. And so, um, you know, people will die who wouldn't otherwise die, but <coughs> should you have to apologize for it? Probably not. In a clinical trial, you sure would. But in this kind of trial, probably not. Now, what, what this points to is that uh, the ethics of a trial like this, which um, in the study that uh, Till and Nir and I and others are, are 
embarking on um, uh, to study are we we call health policy trials. Um, you don't have equipoise, and they're different in lots of ways from clinical trials. And in our view, a regrettable thing in research ethics is that we have sort of one standard model, one standard mechanism for judging the ethics of trials, and that is the IRB in the United States, which treats everything like a clinical trial. So it's, you know, um, if uh, the only tool you have is a hammer, then uh, you everything's a nail. And uh, so uh, when you subject these trials to those through this um, IRB process, you often get uh, rather bizarre results. And just to make it personal, uh, <laughs> Professor Cohn <laughs> recently submitted a totally benign proposal to the IRB on which I sit. Um, I, w I won't describe it because I guess it's confidential at some level, but <laughs> let me just say it was just, it was sweetness and light. There was nothing to object to. And the, the committee angrily sent it back saying, how dare you? Um, seven to one as usual. Um, and uh, <laughs> Professor Cohen meekly said, oh, okay, and totally changed the design of the trial. Um, that's what happened because, because they, were, they were taking this kind of trial and subjecting it to the clinical trial rules. Okay, now let me conclude by coming to the point which I, I would uh, disagree with Dr. Fried. Um, actually, a couple of places. Um, Dr. Fried says that there's, um, <coughs> um, there's an ethical issue only, only um, if there's a lack of transparency. Uh, for him, as, as long as the investigator can tell everybody why it is that these guys over here have to go through an ordeal and these people over here have to copay, whereas these people get it free, as long as you can be completely open about it, he said, that's, that's like equipoise. It sort of sterilizes everything and makes it ethically OK. Um, well, and then he said, but, but what I said was interesting, uh, is that that wouldn't have worked in the case of the randomization with the an, uh, angina patients or with the breast cancer patients. Because if they had been told what was going on, they might have said, I'm not going to do this. Well, if I fished around long enough, I could find the chapter in which here in which uh, Dr. Fried says, oh, no, um, uh, if, if you're going to randomize people, you have to tell them we're randomizing people. It's not enough that it's on equipoise. That isn't enough, uh, at, at least in the Hippocratic situation, because which is what we're talking about. Uh, you have to tell them not only are we on a knife edge in terms of our beliefs about what works best, but you're being randomized. So um, maybe you changed your mind. Maybe you could find out why in the meantime. Uh, but the, 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 the more substantive point, I think, is that um, Dr. Fried's uh, insisted that in this trial, it's not a question of denying anybody anything. It's just a question of how to distribute, and everybody eventually gets it. No, they don't. They don't. Not everybody gets it. The people who, uh, who were in the arm that had cost sharing a lot of them didn't get it, and, and it was known in advance that a lot of them wouldn't get it. That's the whole point of this thing: is that you want the these, you want the people who should who need it to get it, but not everybody gets it, and that's what happens in these trials. And and in this case, miraculously uh, or wonderfully, I guess I should say, the the ordeal turned out not to deny people care, but in other cases, it really, really does. And you don't know which of those is true at the, when you do the trial. And so that's a very much a part of the ethics of these trials. Thank you. Just one uh, correction. I, I think on the course chairing, uh, you got me there. But on the ordeal versus the free, uh, not at all, because one of the uh, points of inquiry is whether people who undergo the ordeal are more likely to use the chlorine, whether the chlorine will incentivize them to use it, and therefore the people who get it for free may have the larger number of deaths. Now, that didn't turn out to be so, but uh, it might have, and they are surely uh, situations in which uh, a good is distributed either for free 
or after some kind of an ordeal in which where it's distributed through an ordeal, it is valued more by the recipients and therefore more likely to be used and therefore more likely to help them. And the point of the trial is to determine which is it because it's not immediately obvious which it is. But I think this takes us back to Spencer's observation earlier uh, about you know, what the point of the ordeal is. Um, in, in the case you're talking about, the ordeal actually changes the person. So they go through this ordeal, and as a result, they're very careful to do a certain thing that they wouldn't have <laughs> otherwise done with such care. Good. As a, yeah, good. OK, but the other understanding of ordeals, and what's going on in some of them at least, is that it doesn't, it, we're not counting on it to change anybody. We're counting on it as like the old trials by ordeal to reveal a piece of nature that we otherwise can't figure out, which is who are the re ones who really need it and are going to use it properly. It's the, forget about any effect on the person. So it's a, again, I think it's an important distinction to keep in mind when we're talking about these things. Can I, can I also raise? So just one, um, or you want to take No, that's that? okay. And then Peter and then, okay. and then So just one point I maybe should have <coughs> highlighted, and I actually don't think they do a good job highlighting this in the paper, is that my understanding is that the cost sharing arm reflects the status quo. So that is the, pr not the way it was distributed. I mean, they, again, they don't say this in the arm, but it's very um, similar to what we did in the bed net trial, which is that the 75 cents was what bed nets were being sold at, and we were looking at does reducing the price make things better. I think what was happening was that it was currently being sold at a 50% subsidy, and they asked if we give it for free or if we do the ordeal, what makes it better? Now, I do think you're right that they impose some sort of artificial scarcity in this situation because they could have given it to everyone for free, and I, I don't think that was the the cost sharing arm reflects the status quo means of distribution, but I think it reflects the status quo price. Uh, so just two points I wanted to, to make. Um, Sorry, Peter, can you just scooch up a little bit yeah. to the mic? Yeah. The, the first one is um, that I haven't read the article and I don't know the study, but I assume, given this timing and this type of problem it is, that they did not measure the outcome of mortality from uh, right. contaminated water. That would be very difficult to do. Yeah. Uh, so, in fact, using the averages of the groups to compare doesn't tell us anything about the outcome, which could be heavily determined by <laughs> behavioral factors in that all the people all the people who paid the money for the chlorine might have saved the lives of their children, and all the people who didn't might have had their children die. So, no. we don't know. We just don't but, know. But, but what the authors did do was they used standard data which they yeah, cited. but that's average data. And then data. they worked out how many deaths there would be, and they came up with that's, a cost per life. That's for, average for, for a population, over. but this particular outcome is heavily driven by behavior. But that's it's why they used behavior. randomization also. Sorry? They also randomize. Yes, but they didn't measure the outcome itself. So we only know the percentage of those who had chlorine in their water. We don't know the behavioral associations with that. So that's just one point. Um, and my second point is a question. Um, but this is a very interesting point about trials like this because when the outcome depends on behavior and we compare averages across groups of an intermediate variable, we really don't know what happened. And so we can't be confident that we haven't caused harm. Um, the, my, but my question is, one of the ways we deal with this problem that you raised in clinical trials is we do something that benefits everyone and then we add the intervention on top of it. Mm -hmm. That was not done in this case. Would that have, would that have alleviated the problem? In other words, if the, the group yeah. that, yeah, if everyone got something beneficial, but then we differentiated the groups according to. Couldn't you, but I think you could, so if that's the current price, then you could argue that the cost sharing arm was beneficial because you were giving it to people while they were wait, offering it while they were waiting in a clinic. Or you were offering it for, I mean, I mean you know, I, again, I don't know the details, but I think that. Uh, they, right. So they didn't have to go buy it. Exactly. Selling it to them right there. Okay, there's a, there's a background issue which I'd like to raise because I think it, it's, it, it affects more than just this case. <laughs> um, it seems to me that the, the agenda here, the agenda for this intervention is uh, saving kids' lives. Whose agenda? Okay, the donor's agenda is the answer. The donor wants to save kids' lives. 
the donor doesn't care about whether they have um, uh, uh, clean clothes, which is what they might use the chlorine for. Uh, the donor doesn't much care really about whether they're a little better off than they might have been otherwise. They just want to save lives. Okay, so uh, a lot of these trials are like that. They're, they're, they're maniacally focused on life-saving. <coughs> Why? Because the donors want to say, we're going to go in and save these lives. Now, the, 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 you know, we were just talking earlier, who, who made this point that the, um, with, the, with, the, with the bed nets sometimes, maybe the family thinks we're starving, let's use them to catch some fish. So they make this calculation. No, 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 we're not interested in whether you're eating. We want to know, are you dying from malaria? Because that's what the donors, that's what you're, you're doing on behalf of the donor. <laughs> now, that, you know, it's great that the donor, I'm not saying it's bad for the donor to want to save lives. It's great, I wish there were many more of them. But uh, this kind of thing happens a lot. Uh, we had a grad student in, our, in the department that uh, Jessica Peter and I are in, uh, who was working in Russia <laughs> with, on, on AIDS in the early days. And there was a charity that wanted to save babies who had AIDS. But the people who had AIDS were largely these really tough and unpleasant looking prisoners. Gay, a lot of them too. Well, our grad student actually, that's who he was saving. But the, all the pictures he sent back were the babies. And that's who was on all the posters. Every, now, the, he knew and the, 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 the charity knew, everybody, everybody except the donors knew <laughs> this is bullshit. And so he, 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 it, was a, it was the first Harvard dissertation that had bullshit in the title. I borrowed a, a technical term from Harry Frankfurt from the Princeton Philosophy Department. And he studied how this, the, the economy or how this works. But, you know, the, the donor's agenda is, is a hidden variable in a lot of this stuff, it seems to me. So, Near and then Chris. Um, in my view, ordeal trials in this particular trial um, are challenging the principle of equipoise in a, in a kind of more commonly. So think about this particular trial. I would say that the challenge to equipoise arises not just in the arm that had a copay, but rather also in the arm that had the ordeal. It doesn't seem to me that uh, a rational person uh, trying to achieve the best for the individuals who could use the chlorine would um, flip a coin between handing it to them and making them run around for it, right? We, usually, if, I, if I'm trying to get the best care for my mom, it never occur I never say, well, there was an RCT, so I'm going to flip a coin between... Um, uh, dropping her by the clinic or dropping her far away, making her kind of walk to blocks. It, it's usually good for nothing. Yes, conceivably, maybe if you worked hard for it, it would change you and um, make you appreciate it more. There would be a cognitive dissonance. Now that I uh, um, got finally the chlorine packet, I should be more careful to use it. But that is, in this case, I think something that the trialists didn't take as a serious, a serious possibility, and that in most contexts in life, we don't take it as a serious possibility. So if we're not going to uh, take it as a serious possibility, the only two options for that arm were either hardly any effect or no effect, which um, is what they revealed, or another possibility would have been uh, that they would use chlorine packets less and babies would die. And the... Um, this is not as good a prospect as the prospect of getting it for free with uh, the zero complication of being dissuaded from usage and potentially uh, having that result for your baby. So in my view, this trial transgressed equipoise. Um, what then should we make of the ethics? My own approach in general is that equipoise uh, is not a correct, it's not correct to require uh, equipoise in clinical trials. Um, so I think that this is not actually an, um, an ethical problem, but uh, people like Spencer Hay, actually are a moderator, and I would love to hear also from him, take equipoise uh, very seriously, and um, it would be interesting to hear uh, from uh, them what they think about the aspect of um, ordeal trials. So there are two, in that arm that underwent the ordeal, there are two things that are worse for the patients, in my view, than uh, the people in the free arm. First, they were burdened. We know that you know 
we pick it because we know it's bad for you to be in, you know, uh, to do that. And B, they um, um, were likelier to get a worse medical outcome. So I don't want to respond to the equipoise thing yet because I feel like in your comments, though, and I don't, at least I heard what sounded like you were actually contesting the whole premise that ordeals actually have this capacity to promote the, to, or to elicit the kind of behavior that we actually think is good. That is to say, by in introducing the ordeal, that's going to get people to actually value and use the intervention in the way that we hope that they would. Are you asking? I, I, was, I was trying to make a subtle point. So we never know in advance. So I, I would, if that's going to be your answer, you're right. We never know in advance what exactly the effects are going to be. But there are some, you know, from a basic point of view, we would um, gamble on what, some of those possibilities uh, more readily than on others. And I think it's probably the case uh, here and in many other ordeal uh, trials in the future that we will, uh, an honest, rational person would gamble. Better for you to be in the non-ordeal arm, thank you, than in the ordeal arms. Uh, that's why I give the example of my mom and, the, you know, we, we have strong hunches on those things in life. Well, there are two different kinds of uh, effect you are trying to produce. One is efficient distribution, which assumes some kind of scarcity. Uh, the other is the effect of educating, eliciting uh, compliant behavior. And that's, those are two different uh, uh, mechanisms, and you may not be sure which one uh, is in play. Now, the idea that uh, when the issue is distributional, somehow you can't engage in a trial strikes me as really rather extreme uh, because if it's distributional, you don't have an unending supply. Uh, the NGO doesn't have endless funds. They are not, uh, uh, there may not be an endless supply of the drug there, or whatever. And what you're trying to do is figure out where it will do the most good. Now, that's one kind of thing. The other, where you don't have a scarcity uh, constraint, but you are trying to elicit behavior, uh, what Sunstein refers to as nudges, these are nudges, that is what I thought was going on here. And there is a problem about it because it is somewhat paternalistic. Uh, as you put it, they're trying to change people. Well, you know, uh, it's their chlorine and they can decide whether they want to change people. They're not the doctors here. They are a uh, they are a non-governmental organization that is trying to use its resources in the best way. And if uh, one of the ways is by educating or eliciting more compliant behavior, uh, how can one complain? Yeah, I mean, so I guess I feel like what Professor Fried said capture some of what I would want to say in response. I mean, I also think maybe, um, in my view at least, that for this for a study like this to be ethical, there has to be an honest null hypothesis, right? Or there actually has to be like an honest belief that the thing that you're testing, the arms that you're testing, have some efficacy or power to accomplish or affect the outcome that you're actually studying, right? So if you're saying that in this case you don't think that the ordeal arm was in any way a plausible rival for the free arm, then that seems to me problematic, because why are you doing the study, mm -hmm. right? If you're rejecting the underlying mechanism itself, right, then it's like, you know, you can't even argue that you've shown something sort of that generalizes even beyond that, that instance, right? And that's look, Spencer, uh, you only you, have a you, rational, strong hunch. You don't have certainty. But, but maybe what you're doing, let's, let's suppose you're a government. Maybe what you'd be doing is not uh, 
uh, is what you, what you want to know is uh, if we impose the ordeal, yeah, we would expect uh, some people not to have clean water, and that will result in some deaths, but maybe not so many. And maybe we save a caboodle of money, and we could use that money to feed people or to uh, you know save improve lives. the economy. Uh, yeah, save lives or to some other worthy thing that governments have to do. And so it's not a question of yes or no. Does it work? Does it not work? It's uh, does it work as well as we would like it to? And uh, it's more or less. And you'll accept some deaths. Now the thing is that the in, in this literature. Um, you know, there are very explicit discussions in the ordeals. Uh, if you impose this ordeal, there will be some people who are not going to get the thing. Uh, now, the, the, the result, though, is, is that the cost of getting it to the people who get it is much lower. So out in the real world, when you're done with the trial, you can do this on a, ma on a massive scale that you couldn't afford to do otherwise. But in the trial, you accepted some deaths or some adverse events anyway that resulted from people not getting what they were going to what, what would be good for them, and that was anticipated, too. But that's, that's the nature of these kinds of trials. It doesn't mean it's wrong, and there doesn't have to be equipoise in any way, I don't think. It's, 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 a, it's a question of better and best, or, or, or worse and, and not quite as bad. Really quick, and then, and then we gotta get to... Oh. oh, sorry, no, no, go. Okay, yeah. May I just make explicit the point that I think has been circulating around that we do scientific research not to benefit the patients or the participants in this particular village. We do it to generate knowledge, which is a public good, which is a collective action problem. And so whether we're serving efficiency here, trying to figure out what's the best distribution policy, or whether we're trying to figure out whether drug A or drug B is better, um, I think that can't be justified based on just the patient that's right there. You have to take the broader population ethic. Um, and so, for example, uh, in the drug context, most drugs that go into phase two clinical trials never reach market because they are turn out to be not to meet the standards of safety and efficacy. And so if that's our Bayesian prior, yeah, this drug's probably never going to make it on the market. Of course we wouldn't do it just for this one patient. Instead, we do it to generate more knowledge of, you know, uh, scientific safety and efficacy more broadly. So I think that's why it's analogous, that we wouldn't have to have perfect equipoise between each arm of the study, uh, but instead have a valid scientific purpose that contributes to utilitarian goals more generally, with the side constraint of some informed consent. What do you tell the subjects in that kind of study? You're going to participate in this larger effort to create a social good, which is knowledge. Um, and in the clinical context, we give them informed consent whether they want to get into it or not. So. Let's open it up to the, yeah, to the floor. Thank you, <laughs> Elliot Prager, um, neighbor. Uh, let's, who's giving me away? Richard. You're a doctor, but admit to it. I'm a recovering doctor. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Listening to Professor Freed talk about the fact that the various arms of the study, the various villages, knew about one another, <clears throat> and Dr. Wickler uh, talking about the fact that perhaps one arm wasn't quite ethical, I was sitting thinking about the experiment, the, the ordeal experiment that's been going on for 70 years since the end of the Second World War with multiple arms in all the industrialized villages around the country, uh, uh, around the world, each of which participating in the experiment of how to deliver health care to their population. And there's one arm that for years, if not decades, has been consistently at the bottom of the outcomes table and consistently for the same period of time two to three times higher than anybody else, any of the other villages in terms of the, of the cost. Now, how do you respond to the ethics of the ongoing existence of this arm? I wish it had been a real experiment. And then they could publish it, and that would be the end of it. <laughs> 
I also had a question about ethics of a research study. Oh, sorry, Ativ Marotra. I guess I'm still a physician, uh, not recovering yet. Sure. So um, uh, the question was uh, the question was driven by what I saw was a paradox in uh, the U.S. healthcare system, which is in the U.S. healthcare system we're very comfortable using financial incentives, a little less comfortable right now at least using ordeals as a way to decrease the patient's demand for a given service. But there was a large debate previously in, uh, about on the provider side and EHRs and uh, prior authorizations. And on the, pri on the provider side, we use ordeals, but we never use financial incentives. And I'm curious whether it would be ethical to do a randomized trial, say, on the physician side, that we have the current uh, 20 minutes is required to fill out a form for a very expensive drug versus we'll pay you $10 less if you order that drug at that visit for that office visit. When you present that idea, like if there was a reporter in here, they would go crazy. How could you ever create a financial incentive for a doctor not to do something? But we already have something with the ordeal of doing the 20 minutes of prior authorization. So I was curious, is that ethical or not ethical to, again, randomize to the current which is 20 minutes of a prior authorization for an expensive drug versus I'll pay you $10 less for your office visit if you order that drug. Well, let's pay for performance. Yeah. And withholds. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's Mike, Mike Chernew, you know, uh, uh, that's what he does. Yeah. So Mike's my partner in crime at uh, Department yeah. of Healthcare Policy, okay. so I know yeah. that work really well. Yeah. But I don't quite understand the uh, equivalence. You think that they are equivalent. Well, it's something in, the, in your ballpark, I would think. I mean, it's using all these financial incentives to change the physician behavior uh, in a way that somebody at least desires. Right. So right now we give global payments, for example, or capitation. We'll say, hey, it's you, we're going to give you a certain dollar sum to take care of your patients, and if you ex you order that expensive medication, you'll be financially harmed. <laughs> But then is there a difference in where it's direct to that specific drug? I don't know. Maybe, there is, maybe it is equivalent and there is no issue from an ethics perspective. We certainly have examples where the market rewards physicians for prescribing yeah. certain drugs <laughs> through <laughs> conferences and speaking engagements and things like that. So. And similarly, lots of self-referral situations where if a surgeon can recommend that, yes, I'll do the complex spinal fusion surgery rather than the simple spinal, spinal fusion surgery, and it turns out I get a much bigger, bigger fee on the, the former. So we have the perverse version of what you're talking about. Can I Which is on it, probably not very ethical. <laughs> so. I have a, a question about um, ordeals. So it's I've meant I mentioned this before, but we, you know we keep talking about introducing ordeals, but it seems to me that the most relevant thing to consider is uh, the impact of removing ordeals or relieving them in a lot of cases, since they're everywhere around us right now. So if we were to, and I think we'd learn just as much actually about so two things actually. I think one is that we're creating global knowledge with these type of trials in the sense of how should chlorine be distributed. But I think there's something larger that we're learning about behavioral responses to these types of interventions. So for example, the Bennett trial and the chlorine trial and ones like it found extremely, a lot of price sensitivity for preventive health products, which is now sort of just a general known um, health behavioral phenomenon. So we know now it doesn't make that much sense to you know, have these tiny amounts of cost sharing for these preventive health. So there's a, a more general knowledge. But in terms of, suppose that the trial was designed the other way, so that the current state of affairs was that you had to redeem a voucher to get chlorine, and instead they compared it to distributing it for free or distributing it in the waiting room with cost sharing. But when we give it for free, we have less of it available. So fewer people would get it. So would that, would there be the flip sort of ethical concern with that trial that you have with this one? You see what I'm saying? Well, but look, when you say fewer people will get it if you gave it for free, it's uh, if you implemented that policy, fewer people would get it. Right. But in the trial, more people would get it. Okay. So that's the difference. We, you know, it, I see. Said, so it's we're the talking about the ethics of the trial here as opposed to the ethics of the policy. Oh. Yeah, I just want to briefly back to uh, yeah. to, to the issue of equipoise, and I, I don't think we should get obsessed 
with perfect equipoise uh, because it actually is in tension with good um, science with respect to the ability to replicate findings. Uh, we also know that initial findings of therapeutic benefit with drugs tend to be reduced uh, in, in, their, uh, uh, it's, it's in their degree of uh, benefit over time and multiple trials um, for many reasons. So we often use a term, um, it's uh, a term that uh, is like extremely unique, which is sufficient equipoise. Um, uh, it seems meaningless on one hand, but it's probably meaningful, and that is where we have a reasonable um, inability to be sure of what the answer is. Um, and then we're going to try to design trials that will be ethical in terms of the interventions we use, will not harm people to the extent that we can, but will still give us generalizable scientific knowledge. Now, Randomized trials are good, and they're necessary, uh, I think, for certain things, for a lot of things. But there is a whole hierarchy of evidence, as everyone, you know, as people know. And observational data can be used as evidence. They're not as powerful as randomized trials, but they can tell us things that some randomized trials can't. So I think uh, it seems to me that with respect to ordeals, we still need the same degree of sufficient equipoise if we're going to compare uh, interventions. We need a baseline because sometimes the, the baseline, it's not whether the intervention will make things better, but the intervention may make things worse. So we need, uh, a, a, if not a placebo, uh, some reasonable comparator. Um, so I, I think we have the same need for good quality scientific inquiry when we're doing uh, a, a trial of ordeals, uh, a health policy or public health trial, if you will, uh, as we do when we're doing a pharmaceutical trial or s trial of a surgical intervention. Well, on that note, I think we're right on time. So I want to thank um, all of our panelists and all of you, and uh, again, to the organizers. Um, for a really stimulating uh, first day. So thanks, everybody.